the Mechatronic and Industrial Automation Program, Faculty of Engineering, Galera University, is pleased to host this webinar with Dr. Oyal Martinez uh, Hernandez, uh, the director of Multimodal uh, Interaction and Robotic Perception Group at University of Bath, UK. This webinar title is Robot Touch and Perception. We would like to welcome Dr. Oya Martinez. Uh, uh, Oya, can you start your presentation? Can you start sharing your presentation now? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the, the introduction. Uh, After you finish the presentation, the questions will be opened at the end of the presentation, okay? Yeah, I think it will take you probably uh, 45 minutes or something like that. That's fine. Uh, can you see my, my screen now? Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Uriel. Um, I'm a yeah, lecturer in robotics at the University of Bath. And um, yeah, so I uh, I will just basically talk about uh, some aspects about touch, robot touch, and some methods that I have been using uh, in my research to do uh, recognition and exploration using uh, some tactile sensors. Yeah, I will talk basically about uh, just briefly about the sense of touch, uh, some tactile sensors uh, for robots, uh, briefly talk about tactile exploration uh, procedures, uh, what is ta uh, active tactile exploration, and some applications as well. So just, uh, for those uh, who uh, uh, don't know where we are, basically, yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm in Bath, it's basically in the southwest of uh, England, and then uh, this is. Um, um, let's say a known city uh, based on the, the the Roman baths. So this is uh, was was founded by the Romans, and also the the Bath Abbey, which was founded in the seventh century. And uh, maybe it's more popular because of Glastonbury, this festival uh, of the rock music every year. And so yeah, for those who who like uh, rock and all this uh, music, and also it's famous for uh, the uh, is we are very close to Stonehenge that uh, as you might, might, have, might have seen this, this uh, historical part uh, before. Okay, um, yeah, so robot touch and perception. I want to, uh, before I start talking about the topic, I want to show some videos about uh, some robots doing interaction uh, with objects using touch and other sensing modalities as well. So here is a, a, a human robot that is is it is covered by an artificial skin uh, which contains uh, some sensors and the idea is to use this tactile interaction to to improve basically the, the communication between the, the human and, and robot but also to use um, let's say to to allow the robot to learn or to do some kind of actions as as humans do in this case uh, the this humanoid is kind of acting like a baby like a uh, moving but also is reacting to the tactile sensing basically or the tactile uh, interaction with the human uh, now this uh in this case this robot is just detecting the contact and is uh, doing some let's say predefined movements what is uh, we want to, to achieve is to have a robot that learns how to do these movements based on the the continuous interaction with a uh, objects around the robot and also with uh, with humans. Uh, there's another robot that is very popular, is the ICOP human robot, uh, which also uh, has uh, tactile sensors uh, in uh, its uh, fingertips, in its palms, and also uh, arms and, and torso. And this robot has been used for um, they say in research on the methods that can be that mimic how humans learn, how humans uh, interact with objects using uh, a tactile sensors, using vision as well, using force feedback, uh, using also speech and different uh, uh, modalities. In my case, I've been using this robotic uh, device and also especially the tactile sensor of this robot to um, detect objects and also to explore different objects using the, the, the skin, artificial skin of the robot. Uh, 
Now, uh, if we want to have robots that are capable of interacting with the, the world, uh, with objects more uh, safely, we need to use multiple model, multiple sensors, uh, uh, vision, touch, uh, audio, uh, as well force. Uh, but yeah, but this time I will just cover uh, some aspects about touch. I won't cover like all aspects about uh, vision. That's for a different talk. Uh, okay. Uh, why is the, the, the sense of touch uh, is important? So some facts about the sense of touch is that this is the, the oldest and most uh, primitive sense uh, in humans. Uh, this is the first sense that we developed and is the last the last uh, the sense uh, that we, we lose before death. Also, uh, when we touch, we basically can build a, a physical representation of our external world. So by touching our uh, the objects around us, we can create this the physical world. We can understand what is uh, around us uh, without the need to look at the object. Sometimes we, based on touch, we can uh, we can achieve this kind of a uh, perception of the objects uh, uh, surrounding us. And yeah, so basically, this uh, uh, sensing modality modality contributes to the localization of objects. We can uh, detect like uh, textures. We can detect shapes. We can uh, detect if something is like uh, very sharp, like in this figure, this cactus, basically. But also, it's very powerful uh, tactile, uh, very powerful so, um, sensing modality because we can also detect very um, soft, let's uh, uh, say, contact, like here, here in this picture. And but also, this is a very important sensing modality, uh, which is a, a non-verbal uh, using a non-verbal communication channel. So we this can be used, for example, uh, for uh, braille communication for those who uh, are uh, have like a visual impairments. Also, is used uh, very uh, important for uh, transmitting or uh, communicating the, the intentions or the yeah the mood the emotions. And uh, yeah, so this is one of, one other things that we can achieve with touch. And so now in the skin. In our the human skin, we have uh, basically all our sense of touch is on the human skin, and we have different uh, uh, nerve endings in our skin. That these nerve endings are very useful to um, detect specific stimuli. For example, uh, we have uh, some uh, nerve endings called uh, Ruffini ending, which are very useful to detect touch and pressure. We have also Merkel's discs. Uh, which they are useful to detect uh, dot, uh, touch as well. We have Mainzer uh, corpuscle, which they are uh, useful for detect like a very, uh, uh, let's say, a slight, a very soft contact based on uh, basically sensitive touch. Uh, <clears throat> we have a Pacinian um, uh, corpuscle, which is uh, uh, allows to recognize pressure. Also, we can detect a, a sweat as well, and we can detect, for example, pain temperature with the free nerve endings. So all these, uh, let's say, uh, receptors, all these uh, nerve endings are in our skin. And we have different, a different, uh, let's say, number of these uh, nerve endings in different parts of our body. And with this uh, picture on the right, called the, called the homunculus, it's just to represent what parts of our body are more sensitive uh, based on our skin. So with this picture basically saying that uh, on our hands and fingers uh, are one of the most uh, sensitive parts uh, and also our lips and tongue they are very uh, sensitive uh, for interaction uh, for, yeah, for getting information from the external world so what we want to have in a robot system is or an artificial skin is to have all these capabilities so basically all these type of uh, nerve endings that uh, allow us to detect different information touch pressure, um, uh, temperature, pain. Uh, and if we have this kind of, uh, uh, say, uh, technology in a robotic device, we can make this robot more safe because we can detect when the robot is uh, maybe uh, touching something that is uh, a bit sharp or is something uh, too hot that might damage the, the robot. So in general, this uh, having a skin on the robot or a tactile sensor on the robot uh, is very useful for a uh, to make robots more um, intelligent and also safe when interacting with humans and with objects. So there have been many, many uh, tactile sensors developed uh, in different uh, labs. Uh, 
and all these sensors, what they have tried to do is to achieve certain specifications. Uh, some of them is that these sensors need to be able to detect uh, contact detection, and they need to be able to uh, to allow the robot to uh, grasp and release objects. Also, uh, they should be uh, they should allow the robot, for example, to to lift uh, and place an object in a certain position. Uh, also, to detect shape, to detect force. Uh, they should be able to detect uh, dynamic and static forces. Um, also, uh, to track the let's say the the contact in the skin, for example, if we have our let's say our palm, and uh, we have the contact in one point. If we are moving our um, finger on the palm, we are basically we are capable of tracking this movement, right? Um, so these should also be uh, available in, this, in the skin. Uh, also, yeah, as I said, detecting the, the forces for manipulation of objects, and uh, also basically tang tangential forces uh, to prevent sleep. And actually, this uh, detection of sleep is one of the uh, still uh, difficult parts to achieve with uh, tactile sensors and robotic hands. One of the sensors that uh, has been uh, used uh, in human robots is a, a capacitive sensor. So basically, it's in, it's in capacitive technology. And one example of this is, uh, the, the, this is uh, the ICOP human robot. Here is um, all this blue part of the robot here, basically is covered by capacitive sensors as well. The, uh, the fingertips are basically uh, tactile sensors and they have also capacitive technology. So what they have inside is uh, an arrangement of these uh, uh, pads, let's say, and they are called taxels. You know, when we talk about vision, we talk, we, we use the, the, the term a pixel. In tactile sensors, we call, it, we call them taxels, uh, which is basically a tactile element. So here, this like of fingertip, this is basically the fingertip of the robot, we have a, an arrangement of ta uh, taxels that allows the robot to, to get information based on of pressure, and this can be used to control the, the, the robot for extraction of shape of an object, for a recognition of an object also, and to control, for example, the movements of the fingers of the robot. Um, here is another uh, example of this technology. This is a barrel hand, a, a, a also a robot which has tactile sensors uh, in its palm and also fingertips as well. So this uh, is also based on a uh, capacitive technology. Uh, another technology is uh, using vision, which is a bit, uh, um, let's say, uh, sometimes a bit interesting because we are using vision to detect touch, uh, but it has, it, it has shown to be very, uh, very robust and also very uh, popular. One of the examples is this uh, a, a fingertip here called the tack tip. This tack tip has uh, basically a camera inside here, and then at the bottom part, it has like a soft component, which has some, uh, let's say, some uh, pins inside this soft material. And because this is soft, when you are touching uh, some something with the with the soft component, this pattern of pins will basically deform, and this deformation can be, um, let's say, uh, captured by the camera, and then this can be used to to control any uh, system or a, a robotic device or to control a a robot hand to do exploration of an object. So this is kind of a combination of, let's say, touch and vision uh, using this uh, a camera. Uh, another uh, um, approach is uh, the gel side, which uh, is also very uh, popular. This is basically com composed of, as well of a camera and LEDs. And in, uh, this ha has been used also for contact detection, for tracking objects. And uh, some of the disadvantages of this two sensors is that they are a uh, big because they depend on camera uh, these optical devices they tend to be uh, let's say a bit big compared to the capacitive technology like the one I showed the previous slide that fingertip of the robot is actually similar to the size of the the fingertip of the, the human <clears throat> in this case yeah it's a bit big but the the purpose of doing tactile recognition uh, tactile uh, exploration is still uh, useful with this uh, technology. <clears throat> Another one is uh, the using a barometric uh, technology. So this, um, actually this uh, image here at the top is called the 
this sensor is called a tactile sensor with, with double K, tactile. Uh, so this uh, component is uh, basically a barometer. So when you press, you can change the, the atmospheric basically, uh, pressure. And this sensor uh, has been covered with a soft material. Uh, usually it's covered by a uh, material called Ecoflex or Betaflex, um, which has uh, good properties that can be used to uh, that resemble, let's say, the human skin, more or less. So if we cover, they basically they have, they have covered this uh, barometer with this soft material, and they have used this to detect contact. Uh, for example, here's an application of this tactile sensor. They have the the creators of this sensor have a, a let's say, attached these sensors on this gripper. Uh, to detect a uh, basically shape or to detect uh, pressure as well. Um, this is one of the let's say limitations uh, is that is um, is very, very specific, very uh, localized the context. So uh, the context. So you want to detect contact, for example, at at the edge of this let's say of this uh, part here. You want to take the contact at the edge of here of the soft material is not really uh, an easy task because it detects mainly just one contact. And in tactile sensors, we want to have a let's say a skin or a tactile device that is capable of detecting multiple contacts. Now uh, there is another technology uh, is based on a magnetic approach. Um, uh, this is a whole um, sorry the shung, uh, shung, um a robot basically this resembles like a like a mouse uh, and this basically resembles like the whiskers of this mouse this robotic mouse so and this robot what it's doing is basically moving its head which is this one here and is uh, moving the the whiskers uh, to detect basically to be in contact with different objects so when these whiskers deflect when there is a deflection because of the contact this uh, angle of deflection can be can be measured and can be uh, based on the uh, whole effect, and can be all this information can be used uh, by the processor, by the computer at, at the back to control the, the the movement of the robot. So this is a very interesting approach. It's inspired by the uh, different animals, uh, as I said, by the mouse, or also by uh, the star nose uh, mole, where they basically have whiskers that they basically move these whiskers to different parts in order to extract information and recognize an object, for example. Uh, yeah, this is just another example of a different uh, device that has uh, basically some uh, magnets and some uh, Hall effect sensors. So when you press these, let's say this uh, uh, material on top, you can detect basically the, the contact in different parts of this uh, device. As you can see, uh, so, uh, this has also two sensors and three magnets in order to detect more than one contact. One of the, the challenges in tactile sensors is uh, basically to have um, a device that can detect multiple contacts uh, with a small number of sensors. And, uh, so yeah, I think this is the last one in terms of sensors. Um, so this is another technology, another sensor. It's called the, the, the BioTact sensor. This one here, this fingertip. And this also uh, resembles the shape of the human fingertip. And this sensor actually uh, integrates different technologies in order to get different information uh, from the, the sensing uh, element, this sensor. For example, it, it can detect uh, temperature, it can detect uh, pressure, and also it can detect a, a, a vibration. So with these three, let's say, modalities, this fingertip uh, has been very popular uh, and attached to different robotic hands uh, to detect and to explore different objects, for example, to detect textures, to detect if a surface is uh, hot or cold, and also it has been used to detect uh, a also object shape as well. Um, this is one, let's say, one of the most advanced uh, currently fingertips, and also another uh, interesting approach that has been recently developed is this uh, a tactile sensor. This kind of, let's say, a, a pyramid uh, sensor. Inside there is um, uh, um, a barometer, so it uses this barometric approach, 
and also it has at the bottom of this uh, the board it has a, an IMU device. So <clears throat> when this sensor is moving, it's able to detect the pressure, but also it's able to detect a, the orientation of the sensor. Uh, so it's combining, let's say, two modalities uh, to for interaction based uh, on touch. So one of the the things that uh, they said now the tendency is that uh, to integrate different technologies in one device to extract more and more information. And what they try, like what these sensors are trying to do is to resemble or to mimic one of some of the nerve endings in the in the skin. As I said, we have different nerves. Ones are for uh, some are for detection of pressure, some for detection of um, temperature, some for detection of pain. So the idea is to combine different technologies to extract these different. Uh, a sensing or this different stimuli with the tactile artificial sensor. Now, <clears throat> so, so in our human skin, we have uh, different sensors, different uh, nerve endings to detect different uh, properties of the object that we're exploring. Uh, so we can, for example, extract texture, we can extract shape, uh, we can extract the, we can, we can also perceive what is the volume of the object we are touching we are holding. We can detect if an uh, so, uh, object is soft or is hard, uh, if it's hot, cold, and also we can use uh, the sense of touch together with, uh, let's say, with um, four sensors to detect the weight of the um, of the object we are holding or we are exploring. Um, so in order to uh, achieve this kind of, uh, let's say, recognition of, of features of different objects, we use uh, something that is called uh, exploratory procedures. And uh, we do this every day. Sometimes we don't realize that we do that, but we do this every day. Uh, this is basically called active exploration. So we have different exploratory procedures. We basically do a lateral motion to extract texture. We also do, uh, we do like a tapping to detect the, the pressure uh, and also to detect a hardness. Uh, we just keep our, uh, let's say, uh, skin or fingers on top of the object, just to detect the temperature. We can detect the, the weight. We can also detect the, the, the shape of the object, the volume. Uh, we can also extract the, the shape using a contour following uh, uh, approach. So we can use all these uh, active exploration procedures to extract uh, information from an object using an artificial tactile sensor. Now, the point is uh, how to make the robot to perform uh, or the sensor to perform these activities or these exploration procedures in an intelligent way or um, in a more, let's say, autonomous way, not like a per-program approach. This is where uh, we use, uh, I will uh, introduce some examples of uh, this active exploration using tactile sensors. So <clears throat> one of the the thing that uh, we have done uh, in our lab uh, is uh, to use the ICOP fingertip to detect, a, a basically, the, to extract the shape of an object. And this shape of the object can be used then to recognize what is this object that the robot is, is exploring. So for that, these experiments, we have, just, we have used the uh, ICOP fingertip, which, as I mentioned before, it has uh, uh, different taxes in the fingertip. Uh, so it has 12 taxes, is a uh, capacitive uh, technology. And in order to extract the, the shape and to control the movement of the robot based on what the, 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 sense, the fingertip sensor is perceiving or is touching, we have used uh, a Bayesian approach, which is a, a probabilistic method. So the idea was to extract basically the shape of these uh, three objects uh, with this sensor. So, one of the things we did uh, is to uh, uh, extract information from a circular object by, uh, this is basically the fingertip that is touching the object, a different part, let's say we just uh, extracting information from all this section at different angles with the fingertip. And all this information was used to create a model in a, a probabilistic model using a, a Bayesian approach. So this is just the, the, the method. I will explain this uh, in a minute. So we collected data from this circular object uh, to cover all these different angles from the object, uh, extracting basically uh, pressure uh, from this uh, with the sensor. Uh, 
And here, this is the, the plot where we are showing the accuracy of this sensor for uh, recognizing where the sensor is touching at each moment. So if the sensor is touching, for example, let's say uh, at the, in the edge, at, on the edge of this object, or if the sensor is, is touching in this part, or a bit closer to the center, or a bit closer to the center. So here uh, is the, the plot, and basically uh, white, the, they say white color means like a, a low error in the recognition, and like a darker color means uh, it's a high error. So with this plot, uh, we can see that uh, in the middle, basically, in the middle of the fingertip uh, is when we have uh, less error for recognition. So this means that when we are touching something and we are touching in a specific region uh, here on the fingertip sensor of this type of humanoid, we can uh, achieve more, uh, say, um, accurate information that can be used to control better the, the robot. Um, so this uh, this approach was uh, developed using the, this probabilistic approach. So we basically get the measurements from the, the sensor, then we estimate the, the likelihood of these, uh, the data we have collected. This uh, estimation then is used to, to uh, update a Bayesian posterior, uh, which is basically the combination of the, the likelihood and a prior uh, a distribution, a prior knowledge that we have uh, from our, our system. And this posterior then is used to detect, uh, to, to estimate uh, or to check if the, the fingertip sensor knows uh, in what part of this object is touching and also the position in here, but also at what angle, because it could be touching in any, or, uh, let's say any position in this angle or any, any position in this angle here or in a certain angle. So here we are just checking if the robot is uh, able to recognize in which position, what position and angle is touching. Let's suppose that the robot knows where it's touching and with a high accuracy, we stop the decision-making process. And basically we control the robot to move to the next uh, uh, process of exploration of the, the object. Now, if the robot doesn't know where is exactly uh, in what position and angle is touching, uh, if the, let's say if the uh, uncertainty is too high, then we basically ask the robot to do um, let's say, a slightly movement just to extract more information in the surrounding environment or the surrounding area of that position to improve the accuracy or to get more knowledge that allow the robot to, um, to be, do a better perception. So once we have the new information, we repeat the process, we get more data, we obtain the likelihood, and then we just uh, update the, the posterior of the Bayesian process and we repeat the same process of checking if the robot knows where it's touching and at what angle. So this process is repeated multiple times until, as I said, until the uh, this belief of being touching uh, or touching certain part at certain angle is exceeded, and then basically this makes a decision, and we use this to control the robot. Uh, yeah, this is the same thing I was explaining before, but just with a, basically just with a, the, the corresponding formulas. So I, I'm sure you all are familiar with this um, this uh, a, a formula, which is the a, a conditional, uh, basically, uh, probability. So basically, we are just checking what is the probability that we have certain class, let's say, a certain uh, object, certain class uh, C, given that we have certain information or se certain observation, which is represented by this set uh, letter. And so this is basically the, the conditional probability. And uh, we do certain processes like uh, extracting likelihood, and also initially, when we, as I said, this is a loop, we will do, um, basically, we will iterate multiple times to get information and then improve the accuracy of the recognition process. So initially, this process starts with a, a uniform, let's say, a belief of the probability of the robot. So basically, at the beginning, the robot doesn't have like a special knowledge or preference for any of the positions or angles where it's touching. At the beginning, the robot believes that all the classes, all the positions and angles where the robot is touching is the same. And then this, uh, but this information is going to change while the robot is touching. So every time the robot does an iteration, this, uh, sorry, 
this uh, information will start changing. Now, yeah, so this um, here is called, as I said before, is called an active exploration process because we are allowing the robot to, to get more information, to do a slightly, a slightly uh, small, very small movements, to get more information and improve the, the belief of where the robot is touching. Now, if we don't move the sensor, this is known as a passive approach or a passive exploration. Basically, the robot, uh, usually with a passive exploration, the robot is not capable of uh, achieving high accuracy when he's detecting an object. Now, here is like a comparison. It's again the plot uh, I showed before. Here is a comparison in these two uh, plots. Or how, what is the accuracy of the robot to detect where it's touching, uh, in what position and what angle is touching the object when we use active, uh, an active exploration approach or a passive exploration approach. So in the, the green line, the green curve is showing how the, the error, basically this is the, the, the error in the y axis. And on the x-axis, basically, we have the number of, let's say, of uh, times that the sensor has has uh, touched the, the object to, to recognize where is located the, the sensor at each time. So uh, with this plot, we see that uh, when the sensor is touching, let's say, uh, is doing just one contact, two contact with the object, three contacts, the, the error is, is decreasing in terms of the, the angle of the object, of the sensor. And also, it's the same case for detection of the position of the sensor. Uh, so if we increase the number of contacts of the sensor with the object, the, the error will decrease. Now, if we do not allow the sensor to do this active exploration, if we just do the passive exploration approach. Basically, you can see with this red uh, line that the, the error is, is higher compared uh, to the passive uh, active approach. And uh, in this, uh, these uh, figures here with these two circles, Basically, just is just to uh, simulate the how the sensor is moving, or how the sensor is uh, basically uh, exploring the object in using these two approaches: passive exploration and active exploration. In this, on the left side, basically the uh, the, set, the the target is to follow these uh, dots. So the sensor should follow these dots, which represents the the edge of the object that the robot is uh, exploring. So the robot starts like a the sensor starts touching any uh, of these uh, points, but is not capable of following the the lines of these dots basically uh, in an accurate way. It's always like a losing uh, uh, the the correct uh, position where to explore because doesn't know basically where to explore. Now with active perception, the robot starts touching, let's say, in a in a point, and is moving, let's say, uh, in a tangential way uh, with respect to this this line, and it's getting more information. Then based on this information, it's deciding where to move next uh, in order to continue with the, the next dot. In this case, is this, for example, it's saying to move in this direction, then explores again, moves in that direction, explores again, and moves in that direction. So in some of the, the dots or these points, you can see that they look like a, more like a, a, like a bolt. That means that the sensor in this point was required more information in order to make an accurate decision. Um, in some of them, like in this case, it required probably less information to make a good decision. So, but as you can see here, still there are some slightly errors or slightly uh, like a movement, not like a perfect. But as you can see, that this uh, simulated approach is following actually the, all these uh, um, a sequence of dots. Now, if we want to see that with an object uh, in real time, so this is the sensor attached to uh, just uh, some arrangement of level components. So the sensor starts touching. This uh, this uh, initial touch is like in a random position. So it, we don't control that. It's just to, to make it more uh, realistic, the, the problem. So the sensor is touching. And while it's touching, is moving, is deciding where to move up, down, left, or right, in order to continue uh, with the exploration of the object and extract the shape of this object. Something that is uh, interesting also from this approach is that we didn't collect, for example, information about what to do when the robot was uh, touching a corner. However, the method allowed the robot to, to make decisions uh, how to treat the information 
uh, from the corners in order to continue with exploration uh, autonomously. So in this case, we are not telling the robot uh, yeah, uh, where to move. The robot is making decisions based on what is getting the, uh, what the information collected from the tactile sensor. And uh, so this case is, uh, I think this is similar pro approach. Uh, yeah, just basically the same approach. So uh, here we have an examples. Uh, well, here we have the, 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 the shapes extracted, the real shapes extracted by the robot from these three objects. And here we have also the shapes extracted by the robot uh, from these objects here. So I will uh, continue with the next slide. We also uh, did another experiment uh, using the, the um, barrel hand. So this uh, has also a capacitive technology. Um, so this is a three finger robot uh, hand, it has uh, 21 taxels in the fingertips and 24 taxels in the, in the palm. Uh, in this case, uh, the idea was to, uh, to allow the robot or to make the robot to uh, capable of deciding where to move next in order to extract the object of, so the, the shape of an object and also to recognize this object, but also in using a combination of uh, Bayesian methods plus um, uh, a familiarity or a novelty strategies. So this idea is to make the robot to explore the parts of the object that are more familiar to the robot that let's say the robot already know, uh, or more like a novel, something that the robot doesn't know yet. So we have this setup. Uh, this is uh, uh, the robot. We have this uh, Cartesian robot that is also capable of rotating. The idea was to detect, to extract this, uh, the shape of these objects, to detect where to, where to move next with the hand in order to, to recognize them. So here we have a, just an example of the, the points where the robot uh, could touch. Again, we don't, uh, once we train the system, the robot decides where to move. So it's not like a, sequ a sequential approach, or like a, it's like an order set of points where the robot is touching. This is based, uh, decided by the robot uh, during the exploration uh, uh, process. So we collect data from the, uh, from the three fingers um, uh, in terms of the pressure, but also uh, this time we collected information about the, the, the joint angles of the robot. So we are doing a, a combination of information here. So we collect the data, we apply the same process as before uh, using the Bayesian method, and we uh, basically compare if the robot uh, has enough information to make a decision about the object that is, is touching and is exploring. If that's true, then basically the robot will say it's a, a, a box, it's a, a cylinder, for example. If not, then the robot needs to, to, to move to a different location uh, uh, to touch again the object and then to extract more information and then to repeat the process of collecting that information to make uh, updating the Bayesian method and then uh, deciding where to where, if this is enough to make a decision now here we we, te we tested three different approaches uh, this the first one is a passive exploration approach uh, in this case this passive exploration approach is just like a random exploration we don't have any uh, intelligent like, let's say control to, the, to uh, for the robot, it's just passive uh, random exploration. So it could start, for example, in this corner and then uh, touch here. But at the end, uh, it, depending on the number of iterations uh, and the accuracy of the information, you will end up with having all the exploration of all the object. Which, if you and then if you have in, information from all the object, then you will be able to recognize the object. But this will increase the amount of time because you need to explore the, the whole object to have a, a good amount of information with this random approach or passive approach. Now, <clears throat> one of the things we explore is, uh, or to investigate is to, what if the, the sensor uh, focus only on exploring the parts where the sensor thinks that there is uh, accurate information because the sensor knows that has uh, achieved uh, accurate information from certain parts of the object. The robot could repeat, for example, 
to touch again those uh, parts to get again good information. So this is called the uh, familiarity approach. And another approach we tried is the novelty approach. So the robot is exploring the the areas or the parts of the object where the robot still doesn't know how is the accuracy, but there is the potential that could be good uh, uh, information in that part of the, the object. So this is a novelty approach. And uh, here in this plot, the first one is just to compare the the error in recognizing the object from these three approaches. Uh, so as you can see, the passive approach, uh, they say the error, the minimum error achieved was uh, about uh, more or less like a 90, let's say, uh, sorry, 10% uh, error, 12% error more or less. And whilst with the novelty approach, the error was about uh, 2%. So, and the familiarity approach was uh, about 5%. So with this method, with these two methods, we can see how the robot can uh, improve the accuracy. And we saw that with the novelty approach, the robot uh, is able to detect the object uh, with more accuracy. Uh, again, here also we have, oops, sorry. Here we have a, the, the plots, or basically this is, the, I believe, threshold, and this is the, the it's called the reaction time. So reaction time means uh, what is how what is the number of contacts or what is the amount of information that the, that the robot needs to collect in order to make a good decision. For example, the way in that you read these two plots is that, for example, uh, for in order to achieve the smallest error with the um, a novelty approach here, the robot needed about a, let's say nine contacts, let's say 10 contacts, in order to, to recognize the object with this high accuracy or this small error. Uh, for the uh, familiarity approach, the robot needed about, let's say, 11 contacts in order to achieve this small error. And uh, the, uh, the passive ap uh, approach, which is basically ran just randomly touching the object, the robot required around uh, also like around nine contacts in order to achieve this this uh, this um, uh, small error as well. So here there is a, a key point or let's say a, an aspect that is always um, um, something that needs to be considered when you do a system when you develop a system that is needs to be fast but also accurate. So here we have the trade off of this approach. We we want we want to have a system that is let's say super accurate but that requires more time to make a decision or you want a system that is uh, a, let's say in the middle that is uh, not not too bad in, the, in terms of accuracy and also uh, not it doesn't require too much information so here depending on your application you can have uh, you can decide where uh, what you want for your system to be very accurate but slow um, or not uh, too accurate and a bit faster. And this is another line of research that uh, to investigate how to optimize this, this combination or this trade-off between these two parameters in terms of accuracy and speed of the process. Um, and yeah, there is another plot that is showing basically this, uh, the same information here, just uh, the error against the belief threshold. And yeah, so this is the object. Now, one of the other things that uh, we've been doing in terms of touch, is uh, controlling the facial expression of the robot. So this is somehow to show uh, or try to show the um, a kind of emotion or to represent an emotion, which is not a real emotion because uh, this is control based on, on the tactile uh, contact. Um, but just to to see how, in this case, was to, well, this investigation was to see how the facial expression can uh, improve or affect the interaction with the human. And this facial expression was controlled based on the recognition of the type of touch applied on a robot. So this was for um, a human-robot interaction using a multimodal sensing approach. So we used uh, touch, vision, and hearing uh, for interaction. And we used uh, an approach called uh, synthetic autobiograph autobiographical memory, where basically the robot remembers a all the information that is co was collecting with uh, 
its eyes, uh, touch, and also ears, or uh, yeah, basically uh, uh, the um, uh, audio uh, sensors attaching the robot. So this is just an example where the robot is basically uh, observing a, a human and is basically remembering the face of the person, and also is remembering uh, what type of touch this person applied on the skin of the robot the previous time uh, or the last time that the robot was interacting with this with this human. For example, if the if the human was touching too hard the, the skin of the robot, the robot will remember uh, that this person was touching too hard the skin of the robot, and the robot might have like a angry or like a sad gesture uh, that is showing its emotions. If the human was touching uh, very soft, let's say the skin of the, the robot, then the robot will remember that this person uh, was very gentle with the robot and may have a, a very, let's say, a happy face, a happy gesture. So this, in this case, yeah, we use a deep neural uh, network approach. Um, we use a tactile sensor, we use vision, and we, we use audio. So here's just uh, an example of the, 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 the skin. So we touch the robot in different ways. And this is a, a just um, illustration of the how the the taxes in this skin look like when you touch the, the the robots. So we have a hard touch, and we have this type of pattern: the soft touch, uh, the caress, and pinch. So with these uh, different types of touch, uh, and using uh, this uh, neural network approach, we were able to detect or to recognize this uh, with high accuracy. Um, and here we can see, for example, the output. So when the robot, when the person was touching the robot uh, in a hard way, the robot was showing this uh, a gesture, which is an angry. When the, the robot was touched with a soft uh, approach, <coughs> was happy. When the robot also was uh, touched by a caress type of contact, the robot was a bit shy. <coughs> and when the human was pinching the robot, the skin of the robot, the robot was uh, kind of disgusted. Here, the interesting part was uh, how to combine <clears throat> vision and touch, for example. So the, the robot is remembering the face of the human, and based on that, is remembering how this touch, how this person was interacting with the robot in the last last time. And yeah, so as you can see also on this plot, uh, the recognition of uh, the, the different types of touch was uh, with high accuracy, almost uh, around, let's say, 95% accuracy. And yeah, so this was one of the methods. And <clears throat> one more uh, work that we have done in terms of touch is about telerobotics. Um, here <clears throat> we uh, use touch, but in this case implemented in a, in a, a globe, basically a device that a, a user was wearing uh, to feel the, the feedback from the what uh, from the different from the, from the distance basically while the robot this icop human robot was touching a, an object and then the idea was to to see how this person can feel or if this person need uh, feels like uh, immersed or um, uh, in the environment where the robot is located uh, here we use this this uh, uh, this globe and also we combine this with vision just to to allow the robot to exp the, the human to explore the remote environment where the robot was located uh, we use all these uh, controllers uh, that develop for this approach. For this project, we use uh, ROS and also another uh, software called JARP. And uh, basically, here is the, the example. So, yeah, this is just controlling the exploration of the robot remotely. And at the back, you can see the, the, the screen where Basically, when my, my colleague is actually observing through the eyes of the robot. And you, you can also see here at the back the skin. So I will be touching now the, the fingers of the robots, the fingertips. And my colleague is going to indicate which fingertip he's uh, feeling. So this is a, let's say a basic uh, globe. And we are now working on uh, adding more uh, capabilities on, on this type of devices. For example, now we are uh, working on a uh, adding a pressure as well, feedback, and adding uh, a sliding feedback as well uh, to make this more realistic. Um, 
Yeah, so this is still a touch, but this is touch for uh, is it, the robotics. And one of the other experiments that we did with this uh, this uh, this uh, device, this wearable device, is to control as well remotely uh, and to get feedback from the Pioneer robot, which was very good because this this project this uh, device was also tested with a person <coughs> that was not able to to move. Was he was only able to move uh, his um, hands and his neck, actually, and it was very useful. He tested it and he uh, thought it was, was a, a good uh, device to allow him to explore <coughs> uh, 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 an area in a building. So this is a kind of, also can be used as a kind of a assistive device for people with different impairments, uh, mobility impairments. <coughs> now, uh, yeah, so there are different challenges that still uh, we need to, um, address with uh, these tactile sensors. So I showed some technologies, I showed uh, some methods, but there are many things that still need to be addressed. For example, how we can integrate different modalities that mimic uh, the different capabilities of the human skin. For example, as I said, to measure pressure, temperature, uh, vibration, also pain, all these, uh, to have all these in one device, but also a device that is small, that resembles a human fingertip, for example, is uh, challenging and is one of the, the interesting lines of research uh, that now people are, are working on. Also, uh, is um, another of the challenges is to have these devices, uh, I mean, in a, using soft materials that to make these more like, a, as a, again, like a, to mimic the human skin, but also to have these sensors uh, with different, let's say, in a, in a certain scale. For example, to have more uh, sensors on our skin, uh, sorry, on our fingertips where they're more sensitive, and maybe less sensing elements in the in our arms where are, they are maybe less sensitive. So having these different of different number of sensors in different parts of the body is also challenging. And of course, uh, is uh, another challenge is to have methods that allow us to process uh, all this information from a single element, but also from multimodal elements uh, in the in the skin, in the artificial skin or the artificial uh, fingertip. And um, yeah, one of the another challenges is to uh, to have how to include here, uh, for example, a machine learning, different approaches of machine learning to allow these methods, to allow the, the, the robot to, to, to do like uh, actions, to perceive, to do autonomous actions and decisions based on the information collected from the sensor. And yeah, how to combine the sensing vision with, sorry, sensing uh, touch with other modalities like the vision, audio, because at the end you want to have a system capable of uh, interact safely with, with the environment and with humans, we need to combine more modalities. So how, how they complement each other, for example, vision and touch, how they complement each other and how they can be integrated in a robotic system in a safe way. Yeah. I think that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, just keep in touch. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Did now you? it's uh, it's start to take some questions. Uh, if anyone has a question, he can just raise uh, hand. He uh, can use raise hand uh, option, and I will get him uh, to talk. Until maybe uh, we start to get uh, questions. Sasta, I have a few questions for you, Oyai. Yeah. Uh, first of all, like uh, tactile, as you said, that a human, when he uh, his tactile sensing, uh, his skin has many sensors. It can sense yeah. touch, it can sense temperature, humidity vibration, many, many things. Yeah. Uh, until now, there is no like sensor which can do all this uh, capability because as well, the, the, the sensor, the, uh, the human can sense the sea force and as well the normal force. Yeah. And 
And if we find sensor that can do some of this capability, it will be very, very expensive. Yeah. And the mm. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. So it's. Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's going to be, as you said, very expensive and integrating all this in a small device is also very challenging and also it will be very expensive. Um, yeah, in terms of detecting force, uh, what usually, uh, for example, in robotic hands, they detect force on the joints, but not on the sensors, right? So you have just a sensor to detect, let's say, the contact, but the force of the contact is detected by the joints. Uh, but yeah, all this integration of these um, components makes uh, these robots very, very expensive. Um, yeah, this is something that is still is under development. Uh, the, I think the most advanced sensor in terms of just the, not force, but in terms of, in terms of the sensing modalities is the BioTact, which uh, one of the, the ones I showed that is combining different uh, elements to extract, a, a, I think, a three or four a different stimuli like uh, vibration, pressure, and temperature. Um, but still, there are many things. Another thing is that the materials that are used usually for these fingertips, they are uh, some of them are like a, some types of plastics, like a, a Ecoflex, Betaflex. But if you want to do, let's say, like a sliding, like you know, your let's say our fingers, with our fingers, this material gets uh, damaged very quickly. So that's one of the things also materials that, that are robust. Most of the materials are very sensitive to shear force because if yeah. you shear, it will be subject to shear force. And yeah. this, mm, uh, as well that, uh, for example, when you saw that using tactile sensing, of course, there are many, many, many resources and as well that using vision, vision uh, with robotics and for shape recognition is become mature. There are many uh, yeah. in robots, many preserves in uh, tactile uh, in vision. But for tactile sensing, it's suffer from uh, yak in this area. Uh, okay, so can you answer why the tactile sensing? They are like, I think they are like yak in this area maybe because of the technology available so we can give yeah so mainly it's, it's mainly because of, of technology is mainly because of for example with with vision let's say we have our two eyes and vision is is mainly in this part right but with uh tactile sensors is in all our skin and we have multiple uh, uh, nerve endings so the technology to have all this info all this information at different scales in a, in a device is more much more complex. Um, I'm not saying that vision is easy, no, of course it's complex, uh, but the technology, yeah, is, um, has, let's say, adapted more to that uh, because it's, let's say, is more lo localized while the, the skin is in all our body. So it's not just one point. And uh, for example, there is one, one uh, experiment uh, from psychology where you, it's called the, uh, to contact, uh, two points of contact experiment, or something like that, where even if you, you are touching, let's say, uh, here, you still, can, you, just, you still can feel the contact around in the other part of your skin. And also another thing is that if you have two contacts, uh, you can feel, let's say, in this distance, two contacts, but if you are closing your fingers, at a certain point or a certain distance, you, you cannot feel anymore like a two contacts. You feel this just one single contact. So all these type of um, all these elements that allows to feel all this kind of uh, uh, feedback is is not easy. But yeah, it was mainly because of technology. Um, yeah, this is the main approach, the main uh, reason, I think. We have a question from Mustafa. So maybe yep. uh, he asked his question. And after that, I have other questions as well. OK. So, so Mustafa, can you unmute yourself and talk? Mustafa Ahmed. Yes. Yes. Thank you for yeah. the presentation. I want to ask about the, the sensor to detect an object. Yeah. Um, uh, do you use a camera calibration algorithms for detecting uh, the objects? Um, because 
I know the camera or uh, a sensor who reads uh, the, the environment, uh, it reads uh, um, a pixels. So I think a, a, a conversion of pixels to metric units is needed. So the algorithm, uh, the algorithm uh, used uh, in your work is uh, a camera calibration, I guess 2D camera calibration or 3D camera calibration, or how uh, uh, do you use a, a conversion to convert the pixels inputs into metric units? Uh, you're talking about the with the, um, the, the the hand, the three finger, or the tap tip, the, just the fingertip. Uh, the hand. Yeah. So, uh, well, in this in this um, well, I, I, I'm, uh, so in, the, in, in terms of the three finger hand, that they say the object was uh, predefined in a it was in a predefined location. So the robot was they say touching around the object. But in this location now for the humanoid, so in that case of the hand, we it was not uh, vision was not employed. Now for the humanoid, uh, yeah, we were using basically uh, uh, this uh, homography approach to convert basically the from the uh, 3D to a 2D uh, mapping basically to do the, this mapping from 3D to 2D. Well, basically a homography approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, do you have another question, Mustafa? Thank you, thank you. Okay, is any uh, one else has a question? Okay, I have a question as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, for example the the experiment you did with using uh, Ego, Ego and uh, the touch sensor from iCup. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this experiment, you are using the touch sensor and Yigo mechanism uh, just to identify and recognize the shape of objects. Yeah, it's to it's to uh, so that the robot was uh, extracting the shape, but was this was basically a way to show that the robot is capable of making the des decisions autonomously based on on touch. So uh, using active perception, the robot was deciding, okay, I need to move. Uh, you know, uh, forwards, backwards, left or right. Uh, also, what is saying how many, let's say, millimeters to move forwards or backwards, left or right, in order to continue with exploration of the object. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is one of the experiments that some, uh, uh, actually many papers use in order to, to test the methods to follow the contour of an object. Um, yeah. yeah, so in this case was that yeah, we use this approach of contour following to test the, the accuracy or the robustness of the method for active exploration. Yeah, yeah because uh, actually, because if we are looking for just to recognize the object shape, so maybe one of the students ask why we haven't used vision. Vision will be like more cheaper. I can recognize the shape of the object easier by using some simple uh, signal processing, uh, image processing techniques. Yeah, yeah, that's what, of course, with vision, you can recognize that. Uh, there, there are advantages and disadvantages. With vision, you, you, can, uh, you, you can do that. But let's suppose that you're in a dark room. You, yeah. know, you don't have, you don't have like, uh, maybe the vision is uh, not as good because uh, there's the light conditions. Another thing is that if you change the light conditions where you are doing the, 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 the process with the, with the camera wheel, you might need to do some changes again because it will not work as you did in a previous uh, condition environment, uh, light conditions. So in this case, we touch uh, the light condition don't matter. Doesn't they don't matter because you are basically touching the physically touching the object, right? Um, and then uh, yeah, in this case was uh, the motivation of touch is that you can you can complement the points that you mentioned. Of course, the right if you have right problem if you the right effect, the right will effect on the image mm -hmm. uh, quality and recognition. As well, if you have like uh, 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 like hole or shape inside a part and it's in very tight space, you can't use the vision to identify how it looks from inside. For example, I can put my finger, finger, mm -hmm. finger to recognize how it looks from inside. For example, if I try to assemble two parts together. Mm -hmm. In industry, this thing is, is very critical, and uh, I think this is the reason they start to, as way well, look for tactile perception yeah. in addition. Yeah. To 
Yeah, so for example, actually, if, you know, this um, there are some um, kind of illusion. There's a uh, you can actually you can uh, this is an experiment also in psychology. You you can see like a hole. Well, with vision, sometimes you get confused. You don't know if this is a a bump or is it like a hole. But with vision, you think it's something there. It could be a, a bump or a hole, depending on the angle you are looking at that uh, shape. But then you can you can reduce the uncertainty of what you're observing by touching the object. So here's what I was saying at the end. One of the things is how to how to integrate both, to complement both uh, sources of information. Um, important. You need to do kind of sensory fusion yeah. on the information from vision and tactile. This is how human, he accurately identifies things and he can, yeah. Yeah, so one, one example, a clear example is when you are, for example, doing something, you are assembling something or you are writing or you are doing any activity. Sometimes you don't need to look at what you are doing. You can look at different uh, uh, part and you still can use do things with your hands, right? Uh, and in assembly processes, for example, there is a, a project where they want to combine vision and touch for assembly uh, 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 process where sometimes the vision of the robot is occluded because of the components that are used for the assembling. And then is when touch needs to, uh, let's say, start saying, okay, um, I can feel that you are doing this because even if you don't see, the robot doesn't see what it's touching but or doing, but with touch, you can still perceive what is happening in the environment. So yeah, there are different, um, uh, let's say, uh, challenges and different uh, interesting aspects. Yeah, yeah we have uh, Mustafa and Ines, uh, they have questions. So maybe we started this time with Mustafa, this time we start with Ines and after that, Mustafa can ask again. Ines, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. I'm uh, Prof. Ines uh, from Physical Therapy Program. Uh, uh, it's a very glad and pleasure for me uh, to attend such uh, presentation. Uh, thank, you. thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, regarding your question, Dr. Ibrahim, about the uh, vision, uh, why we should uh, uh, use other methods, uh, we have. Uh, Yani, uh, otherwise, uh, we have uh, the vision uh, that can facilitate uh, our uh, detection of uh, the shape or uh, the uh, format of a shape uh, of an object. Uh, this uh, method is uh, very beneficial in cases of uh, cortical uh, problems, in patients with cortical uh, problems or have uh, neurological uh, disabilities. Uh, we test the cortical sensation to specific a specific type of uh, sensation. Uh, not the peripheral sensation, the cortical sensation. And the cortical sensation should be assessed during closing eyes, uh, not with opened eyes. But this is, will be very beneficial for this uh, method of assessment in uh, rehabilitation of neurologically disabled uh, patients. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Uh, Mustafa, you were, you still have a question? No, I think the, the same question. Okay. So if there's no more questions, so uh, Dr. Inez, do you have another question? Uh, no, doctor, no, doctor. I will lower my hand. <laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Oya, oh yeah, for this Thank nice you. presentation. And hopefully we see you soon in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, hopefully next year or something. Thank you for the invitation. It was very nice. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. And see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.